An online voters list in Dominica exposed by officials as fake. Our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Tuesday, November 12th from the CMC News Center in Bridgetown. I'm Don Paris. Good evening. As Dominicans prepare to go to the polls on December 6th, the Electoral Office has confirmed that an online voters list making the rounds on social media is fake. Public Relations Officer Elias Dupi says the Electoral Office does not publish, sell or release digital copies of the Register of Electors for any reason. This tainted list is in no way affiliated with the Electoral Office or any of its systems or processes. The public is reminded that physical copies of the Register of Electors produced by the Electoral Office for publication or for sale are the only legitimate source of elector information available in the Commonwealth of Dominica. The Electoral Office of Dominica, under the direction of the Chief Elections Officer, is the only entity empowered by the Registration of Electors Act to collect, guard, and produce elector information, and the production and publishing of these lists is done multiple times per year. As required by law, lists are created periodically and published in each polling district in Dominica and are also made available at the homes of registering and assistant registering officers, at the public library, and at the electoral office. In next month's general election, the Dominica Labour Party and the opposition United Workers Party are contesting all 21 seats at stake. Over in Guyana, the chairman of the Ghana Elections Commission, GCOM, has sought to give the assurance that voters without ID cards will not be prevented from voting in the March 2020 general and regional elections. GCOM last weekend published the names and addresses of more than 19,000 people who have not collected their ID cards since 2008. GCOM had said that those people who do not collect those cards will be struck from the voters list, triggering concerns from the opposition. But as we hear in this newsroom report, GCOM Chairman Retired Justice Claudette Singh says no one will be prevented from voting if they turn up at polling stations with another valid form of ID. This is the procedure being utilized to cleanse the list. We want these names now to be, we can very, whether we, we just want to verify the existence of these people. They should come forward and say, well, I'm alive. Justice Singh said the names will be placed on a supplemental list at the polling stations, which will cause those persons to receive added scrutiny. So it is not GCOM's intention to disenfranchise anyone. And this exercise is not a witch hunting exercise, as it's being rumored. GCOM chairman said the form of verification is provided for in the National Registration Act amended in 2005. Asked why this method was not used previously, Justice Singh said it is added scrutiny in light of the truncated house-to-house -house exercise, which was being done to create a national register of registrants. We are in unusual circumstances following the passing of the NCM last year in 2018. Now, had circumstances been normal, what would have happened? The house to house would have gone its full course and that database would have been retired so then the list would have been verified. You would have persons there who would have been verified from the house to house. Now, so you would have had an updated list, so there would have been no cause to go to do further verification. Approximately 370,000 persons were registered during the house to house registration exercise. After cross matching of fingerprints, there were 150,000 matches in the first tranche. The Commission is awaiting the results of the second tranche. While this much has been sorted thus far, the Commission is still considering how it will incorporate the house-to-house -house data into the National Register of Registrants. 
Trinidad and Tobago's ruling People's National Movement, PNM, is condemning what it describes as racist statements made by the president of the Public Service Association, Watson Duke. At a news conference on Monday, Duke had urged all public servants who have not yet received a pay increase since 2003 to not vote for the PNM in upcoming local government elections. Well, here's what the trade union leader actually said. If you feel to yourself, if you feel to yourself, our vote does not matter. If you do not speak to this issue between now and December, I'm asking all niggas, all black people like myself and what's my goal? My well black. Not to support the PNM. Don't do it. Do not do it. The PNM took issue with Duke's choice of words. It said the party and the rest of the nation were truly disgusted by his outburst. It said that Duke, who is also the minority leader in the Tobago House of Assembly, had described Afro-Trinidadians in the most offensive way. But Duke is defending his use of the term, saying that it is a Latin word that literally means black. The PSA president admitted it has held a different connotation recently, but he said he felt it was appropriate to use based on the treatment of public servants to get his message across. Over in Barbados, political scientist Peter Wickham says he sees no need for a referendum to determine whether marijuana should be decriminalized. And he says Barbados has been wasting a lot of time discussing the matter, while other Caribbean countries have gone ahead with legislation to decriminalize the herb. Wickham says his research shows that more than a third of Barbadians have admitted to recreational drug use, and he says it does not make sense penalizing close to 100,000 people for using the drug recreationally while allowing people to drink alcohol freely. I, I do not believe the issues of fundamental rights, like religious freedoms and so on, should be settled by any referendum. And I, I take that the Prime Minister at the time took a position that, look, she did not believe that 30 people sitting in a room have a right to decide anything. And I understand that you have to be careful with that. But I am sorry, I fundamentally disagree that this is a referendum issue. There are other things that are referendum issues. There shouldn't be referendum issues either. Because we cannot allow the majority of people who are vastly uninformed on these kinds of issues to make a decision in the interest of everyone else. That is the reason that Brexit is in the position that they are in now, the United Kingdom. Because you ask a set of people who know nothing about the European Union, who don't understand the phenomena, to pass judgment on something which will impact on an entire nation. So that's my position on referendum. Uh, I really do believe that the government needs to sit down and think long and hard about this issue. I think that they're taking far too cautious an approach, and they need to liberalize the thing, they need to free it up. Uh, and I think we need to stop all of this needless talking on an issue, and we just need to act and do something. Wickham says while most Barbadians were previously against the use of small quantities of marijuana, research by his organization, the Caribbean Development Research Services, CADRIS, shows that there has been a shift in opinion as it relates to making the drug legal. In 2008, we found that there was 73% adherence to the status quo, where 73% of Barbadians believed that the, the marijuana should remain illegal. In 2014, which was the last time we did a study, on behalf of the government of Barbados, we found a situation where 37% of Barbadians were supporting the status quo. And we had a full 45% of Barbadians saying, look, something has to be done, either fully decriminalized or partially decriminalized. So that 21% shift in opinion in relation to that time. And moreover, the fact that only 37% of Barbadians are supporting the status quo means no. It is a minority of people that believe that this current criminal position ought to be maintained. Now, that was 2014. This is 2019. So much has happened since then. And as I have studied this issue, and I have across the region, what I have found is that on every single occasion that we do a survey, the support for decriminalization increases. Every single time. More people are supporting the decriminalization because more people and more people are realizing that this, this villain that we have created in Ganja is not a villain. It is not the, the, the need for all of this criminal enterprise that it has become. It can all be avoided if we just take a more liberal approach to the use of the drug. Still to come, more drought concerns for the region. That story and more after the break.
On this edition of Caribbean Passport, we relive highlights of Carifesta 14's opening ceremony. Lots to do, lots to see as we explore Destination Barbados. And we continue our look into the Sustainable Tourism Conference held in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. All this and more right here on this station. The market is a bit saturated. I don't know that it's because we're graduating in too many lawyers. Because the fact still remains that a lot of graduates of the UA Faculty of Law don't go on to normal Monday law school and get their LEC. They, they, they find other things to do with their degree. A lot of people don't know all the options that they have with a law degree. I don't think that we are. It may appear so, but the emphasis has to be on quality and not quantity. It's hard. The Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology, CIMH, says below normal rainfall continues to impact parts of the region already suffering from the prolonged drought. And this could affect agriculture, streams and small rivers. Adrian Trotman is the Chief of Applied Metrology and Climatology at the CIMH. He told CMC News that Barbados and Belize are among the most affected countries. If you looked at it, uh, October essentially is the wettest month in Barbados, you know, across the Eastern Caribbean. And I mean, apart from the last two days, luckily in October, if we hadn't had that rain that we had in the last two days in October, October would have been a record low rainfall uh, month, record low. And we were, we were closing on a record low October in Barbados. Before the, before the 30th of October when we started to have some rains. And, and with the next dry season fast approaching, Trotman is concerned that the below average rainfall could lead to a water shortage. At this stage, what we're seeing for long-term drought, and long-term drought is what affects um, the aquifers because as they are away from the surface, away from evaporative loss, it takes longer for uh, underground water to show signs of drought but it also takes long for it to recharge. It's not like a river or a stream that's above water. Uh, yes, it shows signs, or, or a plant. A plant shows uh, signs of, 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 of drying very, very quickly. You start to see yellowing, you start to see browning. But um, in a stream or a, a river, it's above ground, so there's evaporative loss. At the same time, there's a reduction in rainfall. You don't get that evaporative loss beneath the surface. CARICOM communication ministers are calling for the elimination of roaming charges across the region and they have agreed to collectively approach the region's telecommunications providers with their request. A statement said that was one of the priorities the ministers identified as an early benefit with respect to achieving a CARICOM single ICT space. It says the matter was discussed at a special meeting of the Council for Trade and Economic Development last weekend and the meeting agreed that the elimination of the roaming charges would provide social and economic benefits to the region. Grenada's Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Mitchell, who has lead responsibility for science and technology in CARICOM's quasi-cabinet, said this was an issue which would give a real boost to regional integration and has the potential to drive growth and development in the community. CARICOM Secretary General Ambassador Erwin LaRock agreed with Mitchell, saying that this should be viewed as a low-hanging fruit in achieving the single ICT space, which should be realized as soon as practically possible. Practically possible. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, has told businesses in Jamaica they need to start discussing with their banks their concerns over the sliding U.S. dollar. Manufacturers have already started adjusting their prices in response to the depreciating dollar, and the IMF addressed their concerns in a video conference with the media on Monday. We get more in this report from TVJ News. The dollar sliding and businesses complaining it is making it hard for them to plan. But planning is exactly what the IMF says some businesses aren't doing. IMF resident representative in Jamaica, Karim Youssef, says business owners aren't having the right conversations with their banks. You never hear a discussion around, I went to my banker and I asked for a hedging instrument. That's where we need to move the conversation because in a dynamic economy, these changes are going to happen. These, these, this volatility should be expected. 
uh, it's about now how to deal with it. And the call on public resources every time it happens uh, is not always going to be the best, in the best interest of Jamaica in the long run. A forward contract allows businesses to buy U.S. dollars at a set price now, but will get the money at a specific time in the future. In most instances, businesses that enter into such contracts end up saving. So why aren't more businesses doing it? Entrepreneur Mark Gale explained that some banks haven't figured out how it would work. They would basically you know, go to the spot market today, buy the currency today, hold it for me for the three months or four months, and then charge me interest. Mm -hmm. So they were essentially mm -hmm. providing a credit line. It wasn't a, a false contract. What I wanted to be able to say is, I would like to buy 5,000 US, you know, on, you know, in three months time at this rate, you know, and if you can't at this rate, what rate can you do? And I would sign a contract, or my company would sign a contract, agreeing to, the, to do that, because as far as I understand, that's what a, a false contract is. That's why former IMF mission chief to Jamaica, Dr. Uma Ramakrishnan, wants a campaign around the introduction of hedging instruments and forward contracts. She's suggesting that it starts with the Bank of Jamaica. The lack of knowledge and understanding of how a forward market is supposed to work is missing, and so that vacuum needs to be filled. And I see that uh, uh, there's an important role for the Bank of Jamaica, but there's also an important role for them to partner with banks that are doing this, because our understanding is some banks are doing it, uh, to be able to disseminate that knowledge a bit further. The former IMF mission chief is also hoping that more transparency in the foreign exchange market will help to ease pressure on the dollar. The central bank has pledged to do so early next year. For now, it will not intervene in the market. Since October, the Jamaican dollar has declined by 5%, and merchants have already warned consumers to brace for higher prices this Yuletide season. Ahead in sport, consistency identified as a big factor in West Indies' victory in the ODI series against Afghanistan. Stay with us. After an emergency, you can help yourself and others by looking, listening, and linking. Looking because you want to see if the person has some signs that is in distressing. Looking for the symptoms, how best you can support the person. And then listening, because listening is very important. Listening with your ears, listening with your eyes. If you do that well, then you'll be able to link them to the appropriate resources. Be ready, look, listen, and link. I'm Jed Curtis from Jed Curtis Entertainment. I'm the executive producer of the company. Um, do a monthly comedy show with uh, Bob Sumner in Mullingboro, New Jersey. Uh, first Saturday of each month. I heard about the event through Rob Schwartz from Humag Multimedia TV. And uh, he invited us down. He said it'd be good for promotion and, um, and um, push my brand. What am I looking for at the event? Uh, help promote, push my brand, uh, network. You are watching Caribbean Vibrations TV coming to you from the beautiful city that is Negril in Westmoreland, Jamaica. And we're here with the co-owner of Patsy's Coffee Shop, Mr. Elton. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, sir. The first thing I have to ask you is, what was the inspiration behind the name? The name um, came from my partner, Marlon Hall. His mom's name was Patricia. So um, while we were in the process of opening the business, and uh, we were looking for a name, and sadly, his mom um, passed at the same time.
West Indies wicketkeeper batsman Shea Hope believes consistency played a huge role in the regional cricket team's success in the ODI series against Afghanistan. The Caribbean side secured a series whitewash after Hope smashed his seventh ODI ton to roll over the Afghans by five wickets and take the series 3-0. It was their first series win since 2014 and first international win since 2011, and the veteran batsman lauded team effort for the feat. Um, I just think consistency. I think we were more consistent in all three parts of the game. I think it was the first time in quite a while that I could. Bowlers did pretty well um, throughout the series. They limited the team to good enough scores that we can chase as batters. So it's nice to see that everyone came and raised a hand in whatever game it was. Uh, the feeling was good. It's nice to see a nice, young, vibrant team running around the field, diving, stopping balls, and putting it hard up for West Indies cricket. So it's very nice to see, and hopefully the batters can continue to be consistent and win more games for the, for the team. Hope was also in high praise for Brandon King, Roston Chase, and Captain Kyron Pollard, with whom he shared three vital partnerships. Hope says everyone stuck to their tasks. Everyone played the role that was required to, to get the team over the line today. Uh, as you said, Brandon came in and looked like he belonged to um, Roston, continued his form, both bat and ball. And then the skipper came in and did, did his business at the back. It's just unfortunate he got at that time. And Puran doing what he does best, just as far as he got up at that time as well. But the key for us is that the batters make sure that we, we, we understood the situation and we played the situation for the entire series. Left-hander Nicholas Poo Curtin struck his second half century in three innings as Barbados Pride rebounded from a shock defeat to CCC Marooners to crush Canada by nine wickets in Bastyr on Monday. Choosing to bat first, Canada's innings of 161 was underpinned by Arslan Khan, who struck a defiant 76 off 128 deliveries after new ball speedsters Shamar Holder and Roshan Primus rocked the top order with three wickets each. Set a paltry 162, Pride made light work of the target to get home with 20 overs to spare. Opener Kajorn Otley finally tasted form following low returns in his previous two innings, top scoring with an upbeat, unbeaten 70 off 84 deliveries, while Curtin was yet again fluent in notching out 56 not out off 48 balls. Meanwhile, Chris Barnwell's attacking half-century and Raymond Reefer's destructive five-wicket haul spared Ghana Jaguars' blushes against United States. Sent in at Queen's Park Oval, Jaguars needed Barnwell's 63-ball 80 to get up to 226 all-out off their 50 overs before Reefer snatched 5 for 35 with his left-arm seamer to, com seam to complete the Jaguars' turnaround, handing them a nervy 13-run victory. The victory was Ghana's second in three outings, leaving them second in Group B, while the defeat for United States was their second in two appearances. Switching sports now, Trinidad and Tobago's senior men's football squad bounced back from a 14-game winless streak after handing Anguilla a 15-nil defeat over the weekend. TV6's Sergio Dufour took in all the action at the Atto Bolden Stadium and filed this report. If ever there was an opportunity for Trinidad and Tobago's national football team to prove a point, it was against the FIFA's lowest-ranked team, Anguilla, ranked 209th. The match idolized the team, steadily declining in the FIFA rankings, versus a visiting team that can go no lower at the Atto Bolden Stadium. The former appeared bent on ensuring that there was some way to go before the red, white and black football team was completely dusted. They were 4 0 up by the 20th minute. Ryan Telfer scored in the 10th, Marcus Joseph in the 14th, Attila Guerra in the 16th, and Nathan Lewis in the 17th. The national footballers were playing like a team eager to shake off the shackles of 14 winless matches. But while it was comforting to see Marcus Joseph score five goals, their opponents did appear to be in a mismatch. The national footballers exploited their inexperience by scoring again. There were some good passes as well, and never mind the poor defending. The national team moved from being unable to celebrate a goal because they scored very little, to scoring goals without celebrating much. They just got accustomed to punishing their opponents for everything, and it looked like the only athletes on the field that were embarrassed were the Anguilla players, in particular the goalkeeper. 
and his defenders were not doing much to save him from the continuous onslaught of strikes. Debutant Darius Lewis came off the bench to notch a double in the 75th and 79th minutes. In the end, the final result read 15-0 in favor of Trinidad and Tobago over Anguilla, TNT's highest ever victory. Surely, confidence must be high now in the TNT camp. With the winless streak now broken, it's left to be seen if TNT can maintain their winning ways against the teams ranked above Anguilla. And finally, in horse racing in Jamaica, crowd favorite She's a Man Eater landed the prestigious Diamond Mile title, beating the main contenders and earning $6.6 .6 million. It's the second time the five-year-old mare romped home victories for jockey Omar Walker and veteran trainer Wayne DaCosta. TVJ's Denise Walters was at Caymanas Park to take in the action and filed this report. After the two came together, heading into the turn for home, once Omar Walker gave the super mare her head, 15 other horses chased in vain as she gobbled the field up. By stranger danger, there goes the mare, she's a man eater, these three in a tight punch as they go, flashing now toward the final three, and she's a man eater now grabs. As they come inside the final 516, Tuna Silly Arthur in behind. Supreme Soul now asked to go along with Sentiment on the outside. But she's a man eater, turns for home with that lead. The American, Stranger Danger, doesn't seem to be able to cope with the mayor. She's a super mayor. She's the queen of local racing. It's she's a man eater and Omar Walker, a furlong to run in the Diamond Mile. Stranger Danger has no answers to her. Tuna Silly Arthur and Sentient trying to run on. But she's a man eater. What? What a mare, what a great horse, she's a man-eater, probably the best in the land. She wins it over Stranger Danger, Tuna Ciliata, Sentiment and Supreme Soul. The five-year-old bay shattered the stakes record of 1 minute 36 and 2, set and equaled by former stablemate Seeking My Dream, clocking 1 minute 35 and 1 fifth to win by three lengths. The winning connection all had praises for her. Seeking My Dream was a very good horse, but he didn't have any foot, but... This horse is tremendous, you know, she's super, she do everything right. She, she's a much better horse than, than, than that horse, but she, she's very smart, and she, everything I ask her of, of her, she does give it to me. Yes, but we're, we're running a very fast track today. The two-year-old went one, four, and four, so. But it, not, not taking anything away from her, it was a fantastic performance. She, she basically dominated the race on behalf of man, and she could have easily won by another two, three lengths. And that's the sport. We'll be right back. Again, the major developments of this day, an online voter voters list in Dominica exposed by officials as fake and in sport, consistency identified as a big factor in the West Indies' victory in the ODI series against Afghanistan. And that's Caribbean Newsline for news and sport around the clock. Subscribe to KanaNews.com and for more of our programming, log on to CaribVision.tv and check out our YouTube channel. We'll be back here again tomorrow, but from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching and have yourselves a good night.